Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you uh, so much, Dwayne, for that uh, warm welcome. And it really is a, a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, Bernadine and I are old campus crusaders. We've never been on staff, but we went to a lay institute in Lake Yale uh, years and years and years ago and uh, met Dr. Bright there and a lot of other very interesting people, and it was a, a life-changing event. Today, um, I'd like to talk to you about dealing with failure because I want to explain to you about a big event in my family. Probably everybody here has experienced failure. Uh, you may have experienced failure in your family, with your children, uh, with your business. Well, there are a lot of areas in life where we experience failure, and it's not fun. Uh, somebody here has, has experienced failure. Everybody here, probably somebody here is dealing with failure today. You might not really look at right in the eye and say this is failure. But the question is, how do we respond? You know, how do you respond? How would you respond to failure? And it really begs the question, uh, how much is God involved? And when I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk mostly about business failure today. Uh, and uh, although the principles that I'm going to talk about rely, relate to all types of failure, uh, the question that always came up in my mind back in the earlier days is, does God have any interest? Does he have any concern? Does he have any purpose in my business life? Uh, does he have a purpose in the marketplace? Even my own personal involvement, does he want me to be involved in that? And the most impactful decision of my life was when I was experiencing failure back in my first management promotions. I started as a sales rep and then moved up to a management pro pro a position in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is where my lovely wife is from. She's a Cajun. She's a Cajun. Real life Cajun there. She happens to be mostly Irish, but she's still a Cajun. <laughs> By osmosis, she got it down in Louisiana. But uh, uh, I was promoted to a management position and... You know, I had been a salesman, and I was a total failure because, you see, uh, managing and selling are two completely different skill sets. Uh, I often say it's like if you were a uh, catcher on a baseball team and the owner promoted you to be a goalie on a hockey team, you know, <laughs> and all of a sudden you got to learn how to skate or you're out of business, and that's kind of the position I was in. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what happened in my life because Remarkable things happened when I saw how to move my life over into the kingdom. I was a Christian. In fact, I'll start with a little family history. I, w I grew up in a very, very stable Christian home. My father was a, a preacher. Uh, we were always regular in church. Uh, it gave me a great, great foundation because in our home, uh, the Bible was the final result, the final place to go for answers to all the problems that we faced. We based all of our decisions were based on the Bible. And I saw a great consistency, particularly in my father's life, in that regard. Uh, I learned godly responses to the problems that we face in life. You know, one of the big problems we face is ungodly responses, and particularly in business. You know, things like humility, where uh, we should be humble. Uh, and, and because humility precedes learning, we can't learn if we're not humble. Uh, and also the scripture tells us that uh, God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. And you know, most of us CEOs are really pretty proud of what we've done, you know. And we all have this. Someone, friend who introduced me said he has an adequate ego, and my wife would underscore that. <laughs> <laughs> and yet pride, you know, uh, 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 humility really is a very important thing. And um, it was 11 years of age when I received Christ as my Savior. And what happened then is that I recognized that I was a sinner. Now, probably you'd say, as an 11-year-old boy, what kind of horrible sins had you committed, Wes? Well, I'll tell you. I had stolen. Most of you have. I've lied. Most of you have. I had disobeyed my parents. Most of you have. And I picked on my sister unmercifully. <laughs> and so those were the, prior, the primary sins. But I, I knew that I needed a Savior. And I opened up and asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. And that was in a very, very important thing because that was the basis of empowering everything else that happened in my life. And I would say to you today, uh, if you've never experienced this transforming experience, here at a meeting like this, we can teach you how to act like a Christian. But that's different from being a Christian. Many of us go to church and we learn how to act like a Christian. We want to be a good person. That's a real frequently used phrase that you're here. You're a good person. And you can learn how to do that, but it's without the power unless you're connected, unless you're plugged in to the Holy Spirit and you've received Him into your life and you've had a transaction in your life where you've actually invited Christ to come into your life. And the great exchange kind of reminds me of what that's all about because in a sense, you exchange your life for His life. You give Him your life and His life comes into you. 
completely different world. Now, the, going back to the uh, hurtful experiences in growing up uh, and godly responses to that, you see so little of that today because so many homes, uh, kids aren't taught godly responses. They're taught ungodly responses, which they learn from television or from the Internet or from other sources or from books that they're reading. And, uh, uh, for example, response to authority. And it seems to me now with the young people that I work with uh, that there's not really the reverence and respect for authority as there was when I was growing up. Huge change there. And yet the Bible teaches that we should respond correctly and with uh, obedience to all authority because all authority in our lives has been placed in our lives by Him. Um, they also forgiveness, being willing to actually when somebody offends you uh, to say uh, whether or not they ask you to forgive, a godly response would be to choose to forgive that person. But in true re reality, many of us turn to revenge. And I see that particularly in my business career where people, if somebody did you in, you tried to get even with them, you know. And so uh, those are the kinds of ungodly responses that we can learn. But what a wonderful thing to grow up in a home where you learn these godly responses because there's so much problems with our young people that it's caused by an improper or ungodly response to childhood pain. And we all have childhood pain. Every one of us here has some childhood pain. Most of mine came from the immediate family. You know, but sometimes it comes from a lot of other sources. It doesn't stop. You have adult pain too, you know. You know so it, it, and learning how to react to it is, is really important. Well, to get to the real um, illustration I wanted to share with you is the transition to management, my big management uh, assignment. And this is job that I thought I wanted, and I was failing. And uh, I knew I was failing because it was the only time in my career that I actually went out and interviewed for another job. And to tell you how desperate I was, I interviewed with our big competitor, who was the Xerox Corporation. You can imagine, it's like, it's like interviewing with the Philistines. <laughs> I, went, I, I went down to see if I could get a job with those suckers, you know. <laughs> Um, so then I spent the rest of my life, you know, battling against them. Uh, in the scripture, by the way, it tells us to uh, pray for those who despitefully use you. So uh, I always had a problem, you know, kind of praying for my competitors. And my wife was a great encouragement to me in that regard. But one night I, I, down in Baton Rouge, I came home and my wife suggested that we go to church uh, that night because there was a guest speaker in town. And uh, she said he's pretty good. And um, he preached a message that night that got penetrated right into my heart. I think I had probably heard it before, but it didn't get in. Because you see, when you're hurting and you're failing, God can use that to open you up to receive the truth. And that's what was happening in my life. And I had never really understood the Holy Spirit's presence and work in my life. Sure, I was born again, but I didn't understand what he wanted to do in my life. And uh, in fact, I studied this a lot, and it seems to be a pattern in the lives of most Christians. Many of you right here today probably would have this pattern. There's frustration or failure that comes from a failure in business or in the family or something along those lines. And when we confront that failure, basically what we do is we increase our own effort. We work harder, we work longer, we work with more intensity, uh, we go to self-improvement courses, we consult with others, and we attend seminars. And we do all these kinds of things to try to overcome this problem. Uh, and that doesn't work, and so then we start thinking about escaping. That's the third point, escape. And like, uh, let's relocate. Let's, go some, let's get a different job. Let's change jobs. Obviously, that didn't happen to me because I stayed 46 years with the same company. It's common today to change jobs, but just escaping to change jobs is a really bad thing. Or let's get a divorce. Or let's move to California. Things are better out there. <laughs> Some of you, some of you got that. <laughs> uh, we think of changing our circumstances, and that would lead to fulfillment. And, um, but, you know, in that effort, the discontent and frustration and failure continue. And uh, a fear of failure is a horrible motivator. It's a horrible motivator. It will get you up early in the morning. It will keep you up all night. But fear of failure as a motivator you know, we used to really do interviews about and try to figure out if the people we were hiring, if they were driven by a fear of failure. And uh, we were always advised not to hire those who had that as a primary motivator. And at this point, if we don't turn to the one with the answer, this cycle, this vicious cycle that I've, that I've told you about, it just repeats itself over and over and over again. Now, what can happen is that failure can break down the wall of pride and it can open us up to seek the Lord. And that's what happened 
to me because you see our only source for this solution is with the Lord. It's an openness and a transparency before him that leads us to the truth. The scripture tells us tells that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. There's a beautiful scripture that really explains this and I won't go into a lot of detail to break this scripture down but it's Galatians 2.20 which most of you are familiar with. I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so it's the great exchange of his life for mine, you know, where he comes in and he runs the show. Here's a quote from Oswald Chambers. God delivers us from sin, but we have to deliver ourselves from individuality. That's kind of a penetrating thought. To present our natural life to God and sacrifice it until it is transformed into a spiritual life by obedience. And so you see, we don't escape by any of these things. There's no trick here that gets you off the hook in terms of being obedient to God's call and to God's purpose. Interesting that we do that. And, you know, the thing that came out of this is I got a revelation there that God had a will and a purpose in my business life. Would you believe I had totally compartmentalized that before? I went to church. I taught a Sunday school class. I was a deacon. I tithed. I did all this stuff. And yet when I went to work on Monday morning, I didn't really think about that God had a purpose in it. I mean, I never made the connection. And when I began to understand that, it opened up a whole new world for me. Uh, There's a great book. It's old, written back in the 1800s by a lady named Hannah Whitehall Smith. It's called The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. Now, you can get it on the Internet. I believe you can get it free, A Christian Secret of a Happy Life. Now, why does she call this thing a secret? She's talking about the spirit-filled life. What I just described to you happened to me. That's what she's talking about in that book. And why does she call it a secret? Because I'm fully convinced that very few Christians ever really grasp this truth. I mean, we work all around it. We mess all around with it. But we don't really grasp that great truth. And without that, there's no freedom. And we're in bondage, you know. And uh, so it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, And also, Colossians 3.22, let me understand that I was really working for the Lord. It was Him who paid me. It was Him who called me. It was Him who gave me the promotion and everything else that came in life. It was really from Him. So you see what was beginning to happen there is that I was moving my business career. Little did I, I didn't know this terminology at the time, but I was moving my business career out of the secular world and into the kingdom. Just think about that. Here's another quote from Oswald Chambers. Confidence in the natural world is self-reliance. In the spiritual world, it is God reliance. And so when I began to understand that I was called to my work because I grew up in a home with a preacher, you know, so obviously as a little boy, grandmothers and mothers tend to say, I think you're going to preach, son, you know. My son, who is a minister, by the way, said the worst thing that can happen to you is to be called to preach by your grandmother or mother. <laughs> I could tell you some other stories about that, some things that happened, but, uh, uh, but you know, that, that happens. And so I, wasn't, I never felt called to that, but I always felt like something was missing because I thought, well, Am I supposed to preach? Am I supposed to be a missionary? Am I supposed to be one of those select jobs that God's called called you to? Or could he actually call me to a career in business to be his representative in the marketplace? That's the conclusion that I reach because, you see, his intent is to express himself through Christians, not only in life in general, but in the marketplace. He wants to express himself. That's what this organization, I believe, is, is talking to you about, is expressing himself in the marketplace. And by the way, just as an aside... Uh, Lloyd John Ogilvy wrote this little thing. There is no burnout when your work is based on a love relationship. Today we meet a lot of people who say, I just burned out. You know, I believe this is true. And so you see the Lord used platform, a platform of failure uh, for my success and to begin to build a lot of things into my life that were just missing in the past. Winston Churchill wants to find success is the ability to move from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. And I would say the essence of that is reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ. What actually happened in my business at that time? Well, um, you see, God's direction and the secular world's direction often are opposite. Opposite, you might find, you might be told by your advisors, this is what you do in this situation, but you might look at God's Word, you find something completely different. Every business situation should be a matter of prayer. And we should consult the Bible for all of our answers. Uh, Did you know there are over 2,000 verses in the Bible that relate to business? 
And when I discovered that, you know, and one of the, book, one of the books I have here that I've written, I just thought, I don't believe the world in general realizes how much the Bible speaks to business. Now, sometimes it's a little obscure because the businesses referred to in the Bible are not big corporations. We're talking about sheep herders and goldsmiths and things like that. But, uh, uh, but it's all there. And uh, if we trust the Lord for his direction and spirit and correction, when, then we're on the wrong tack, track. And you see what happens when we move our business out of the secular world and into the kingdom. All bets are off. Things change. There are miracles that can, God can do that, that can't happen any other way. What is impossible suddenly can become possible. Things that appear right are often wrong. And so what began to happen in my business is a whole lot of wonderful, wonderful, miraculous things. And I could just tell you a lot of stories about that. But one of the things is how surprised I was when I became president of the company. I'd always worked real hard, uh, believed in really making making sure what I did was excellent in its quality. And one day, you know, my wife and I were invited to a meeting, and they announced that I'd been elected president of the company. Now, I thought Lanier was a family-owned company. I thought one of the family guys, there was a guy who worked right alongside of me. I thought he'd get the job. I, I, I never even, I mean, I knew I wanted the job. I thought I could do it. As my wife said, I've got an adequate ego. So, you know, <laughs> I thought I could do the job. In fact, I have to tell you that I thought I could do better than some of the things I was seeing, you know? Don't you all kind of get that idea? With any boss you've ever had, it's kind of normal to do that. Just don't act on it, you know? <laughs> could, could result in something not so good. Uh, I could tell you about getting the Kinko's business. I met this guy named Paul Orfala, who is Kinko, by the way, who owned Kinko's on a trip that my wife and I went on, and we became friends. I went out to Ventura, California, and sat down with him. And you know what he said to me after we talked for a while, we talked pricing, he said, Wes, have you ever sold 1,000 copiers on one call? And I said, no, Paul, I never have, but I've always wanted to. And he said, well, today's going to be your day. <laughs> that became a $30 million business, you know. It was a miraculous thing. I mean, just, just a gift from the Lord. And so you see, uh, uh, the kingdom life, when we move our business over into the kingdom life, it really changes things. There's, an, uh, uh, there's a, uh, a story in the Bible about moving a business over into the kingdom that I love. Some of you here have heard me tell this before. It's not real obscure because you all know the story about a businessman in the Bible named Peter. Now, we said that the businesses in the Bible were different, and Peter was a fisherman. Looks like he wasn't a particularly good fisherman. And, you know, he'd been out fishing all night because in that sea they only fish at night, okay, because that's when the fish come up, and they can get them with these big nets. So they fished all night and caught nothing. And Jesus had come out into his boat to speak to the throng of people that were there on the shore. And then after that was done, he said uh, push off and let's go out and let's go fishing. And Peter said, there's no point in doing that. Now keep in mind, he was a pro professional, okay, a professional fisherman. Okay, so he pushes off, but he said, well, well, there's no point, Lord. We fished all night. We didn't catch anything. And he said, that's okay. Go ahead and push off because we're going, let's go fishing. And so Peter said something real important at that point. He said, at thy word, I will do it. That's the key phrase. Now, you all know what happened. We moved out, and a miracle happened because when they got out there, they put the nets out. They caught so many fish, it was breaking the nets. They had to call for another boat to land all the fish. And it's the wrong time of the day, and they're now in the daytime. Fish don't come up here in the daytime. You can't catch fish in the daytime. Every professional knows that. And that was a miracle. So what I'm suggesting to you is that when we began to move our business career over into the kingdom, God can take charge, and he, some, he can do some miraculous things in your life. He did some miraculous things. I just told you one or two stories. I could tell you a lot more stories of things that just happened, and there was no explanation. How about somebody giving you a $200 million business and paying you $50 million to take it? <laughs> Ask me later. I'll explain that to you. <laughs> I'm not sure you could pull that off in the secular world. <laughs> now, the book, this book, um, when I retired, uh, I really wanted to, I'm thinking about all the miracles. I'm thinking, boy, if I could just show this to a lot of people. So I actually uh, wrote two books. There's one over there called High Performance Ethics. And that one, what's that 10 mean? Is that, are you grading my speech? Or, yes, I'm a 10. <laughs> oh, I thought maybe it meant my fries were ready, you know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, I had this burden to tell people 
particularly a, a lot of the men and women that I work with, they really didn't know what happened. I worked at a publicly held company. Uh, we were owned by the Harris Corporation. Publicly held companies, you know, you really get squelched a lot of times from talking much about the Lord. It's really, really difficult. Uh, and so you kind of fly, uh, you're kind of stealthy flying under the radar and all the time. And when you quote scripture, you don't mention that it's a scripture because most of the people on the board don't know it anyway. So you just tell <laughs> uh, uh, so, <laughs> so you could kind of fly in there under the radar, but they all, always they knew something was weird about me, you know. And it's kind of like, well, we like being with him, and he produces really good growth and lots of profits, so cash flow is marvelous. Uh, so you get treated pretty nice on that, but it's like you have some kind of disease or something, you know. No close fellowship because there's something about you that bothers them a little bit. But I'll handle that without any problem. I, I grew accustomed to it and kind of thought it went with the territory. And uh, I really wanted to tell uh, uh, everybody about what had happened. So I wrote that book uh, with a guy named uh, Jim Lucas out of Kansas City. We co-authored the book, uh, High Performance Ethics. It's based on the Ten Commandments. And then the second book, uh, Shop Floor to the Top Floor, Releasing the CEO Within. Now that releasing the CEO within is all what we've been talking about here today, is the release of the spirit in your life. And all of you are CEOs. You might say, well, I don't own my own. No, no, it's not what I'm talking about. It, unless you get, not so literally, but let's use it figuratively. Like you may be the CEO of your home. You should be. If you're a man and if you're a woman, you're the chief COO. You're the chief, chief. And you may even be the CEO. <laughs> Depends on your husband. <laughs> but I traveled a lot and I did. My wife was a CEO when I was gone. But when I came back into town, she shifted over to be the COO. Uh, and we worked in tandem. And... Uh, and manage our family accordingly. So we had a lot of fun together and produced a really uh, wonderful family of all those 22 grandchildren. They all know the Lord personally. So we have the books here. If anybody's interested, uh, you can feel free to go over there and buy the books. They're $10, uh, which is a real good buy in terms of uh, the price off the Amazon.com or something like that. Uh, and we have a special if you wanted to get all four. My wife's books are over there too. She's also written a couple of books, uh, How to Help Your Husband Be Successful. It's called Her Husband's Knowing the Gates. It's a tough book, uh, and he's got another one over there called Bending the Twig, which is how to raise uh, children the biblical way. These books, you know, to the secular world are weird, <laughs> <laughs> but she's right on target. She's got the results to prove it, you know, and that's, uh, that's what you go by in, in business, right? Results always work out. That's how I was able to keep my job. I had results. You know, they might not have liked me for certain other reasons. You know what this meeting is all about is uh, you're going to be asked to participate in some training programs with Crew Atlanta, and uh, Dwayne, I think, is going to tell you more about this, but uh, this is to get you involved, uh, if you're a Christian, to get involved in sharing your faith or whatever in the marketplace so that you can move at your little sphere of the marketplace. You don't have to be a CEO. I was just a manager of Baton Rouge District Office when this began to happen to me. You can move your department. Your, your, your era. Maybe you're just an underling who reports to somebody. You can move that right into the kingdom of God just through faith by trusting the Lord to work in and through that. You'll be amazed what kind of opportunities he'll open up. So uh, Dwayne is going to come now, I think, and explain more about uh, Crew Atlanta and the opportunities. It used to be prior to Associates, now it's Crew Atlanta. Explain to you about the opportunities here for training and for your participation in the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you.